Welcome to Hence the Future podcast. I'm Madam Cronin. I'm Justin Clark. And today we're discussing the future of U.S.-China relations. That means we'll get into why the COVID-19 crisis is accelerating the great decoupling between the U.S. and China. We'll also discuss what that decoupling means for the future of America, China, and the rest of the world. And towards the end of the episode, we will explore what it might look like to live in the U.S. and to live in China, respectively, in the worst case, the best case, and the most likely future scenario. So to start, Justin, let's talk about how the U.S. approach to China has changed recently. So since the 1980s, you know, when Nixon sponsored China's entry into the World Trade Organization, the America strategy has really been to help them develop their economy, help them bring their population out of poverty and really sort of act as like a big brother to them with the assumption that eventually democracy would come along for the ride and that they would come to realize the same values that we care about in America. And it's clear now that that hasn't really panned out the way that America planned. So I'd like to get a sense from you of Why right now? Like, why are we just realizing now that it's probably not a great idea for America to be totally dependent on China for its supply chain uh, amidst a crisis? Yeah, so the interesting thing about right now is we're seeing how dependent we are on China. And particularly in terms of the supply chain and all of the personal protective equipment, for example, that Mm -hmm. China manufactures, we need that. And the fact that we are so dependent on China for making all of these things and not just, you know, not just personal protective equipment, but some of the um, best selling items like iPhones are Mm -hmm. made in China. And we're just in a situation where we can't depend on them anymore because we don't know exactly what their motivations are and there's just so much up 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 in the air about what the values of china will be going forward yeah it seemed you know one way i've heard it summed up is that we're moving from a just-in-time economy to a Mm -hmm. just-in-case economy so whereas in the past 10 years the whole business motto was efficiency 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 you know, mm-hmm. just in time production, getting things at the lowest cost. And if yeah. you didn't build your factory in China, you probably would lose out to your competitor who did build their factory in China. So that mm-hmm. was sort of our whole approach. And now we're kind of realizing that there are some serious flaws in that approach, especially when there's limited resources. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's one thing if you depend on China for your t shirts and retail like clothing. You know, no one's going to die because they didn't get a new T-shirt. But when you depend on them for the actual pharmaceuticals and medicine we give our our, our citizens, when you depend on them for, you know, the PPE, like you said, that our doctors need. And, you know, also for our one thing you brought up, our technological infrastructure, you know, that's Mm -hmm. been a major concern recently with 5G and, you know, iPhone production and all of that. So... I guess one thing that's interesting to me is sort of how this realization has slowly shaped over time. Like it seems like it kind of started in, you know, Obama's administration with, you know, extra posturing in the South China Sea. And, you know, there was the mask was sort of starting to slip off of what China's real intentions were in those Mm -hmm. days. But, you know, it really, I, I think, fully came off with this current crisis and it seems like now whether or not you know decoupling is is the best path forward it does seem to me to be kind of inevitable now and almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy because we kind of expect it on the u.s and china probably expects it on their end Mm -hmm. yeah i'm really interested to see what the world thinks of china after this and how that how the world's view of China changes. Because one of the things I'm sort of concerned about is the the false equivalency of a Chinese person and like China. Because totally. if we talk about the victims of China, the citizens of China 
are probably the number one victims and the vast majority of them are victims of the people's Republic of China. And I just, you know, I I feel, you know, we should make that clear. It's not that we, anything we say critically in this episode about China, we're referring to the Chinese communist party, the rulers and the way Mm -hmm. they set up the system, not the people themselves. Yeah. It's just really, because the thing that I have also seen is like stories of, people like Ch- Chinese American people walking around in stores and then getting spat on or something and I I would hate to see racism yeah. come up from you know as a result of this but it that sort of points to the fact that views of China are plummeting but yeah. it could be you know <laughs> I'm a little worried about that at the same time because if we like put our if we blame the wrong group of people for this then things could get bad yeah and that's that's one of the biggest worries i have as well because while the views of you know towards china are are getting worse in the u.s the views towards americans in china are getting far worse as well you know Mm -hmm. china just ousted pretty much all foreign journalists they've also banned almost any foreigners from entering the country and when you think about what that means, it's like there is no longer really any way for a Western viewpoint to get into the Chinese information ecosystem. Mm -hmm. You know, Hong Kong used to be the quote window to the West where that's what you would go if you were, you know, if you worked for some international company and Mm -hmm. you wanted to do business in China, you'd go to Hong Kong and that's where you could sort of have normal freedoms that you would have in the West while still getting yep. a foothold into the Chinese market. That's now gone. The you know journalists in both countries were not sharing our journalists. The great mm-hmm. Chinese firewall, which is, you know, they block all sorts of information coming into there. That's stronger yep. than ever. Uh, you know, I saw recently they banned Animal Crossing because... Really? Wow. Yeah, they banned Animal Crossing in the country because people were doing like, you know, free Hong Kong, like holding up signs in like the Animal Crossing game. Oh, <laughs> like they wow. literally this is they've banned Animal Crossing. They've banned Winnie the Pooh. They've banned mm-hmm. Wikipedia. So it's easy to just like think, oh, well, you know, America's bad, too. But when you think about how tight their control is on information and what you're allowed to think and say and what opinions you are allowed to have. To me, it's like absolutely terrifying and it's hard to overstate it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I totally agree. It's one of those things where if it goes on for much longer, you're going to see a pretty large chunk of the population only thinking one way. Because right now, the the current people in China, they've seen changes. They've seen the Tiananmen Square incidents and there have been people know about these things, but let's say we push it out a couple generations, what does the, what is 95% of China think? It's probably going to be very pro-China. They're, they might think the rest of the world are essentially demons in the way that mm. they do things because that's what they're fed. And that's the scary thing is like, this is setting up for future generations, not necessarily the current ones. Like if, for example, if China just gets through and weathers this storm of like the current generation, basically the people that are alive today until, you know, those people are gone or don't have any influence. It could be really scary. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's like, it it reminds me of the book, you know, 1984 where the main character, Mm -hmm. he's one of the few people that kind of remembers what it used to be like. And so Mm -hmm. he's trying to like find old timers who still remember what it used to be like. Mm -hmm. But that is slowly dying out. People who remember what freedom was like are no longer around to talk to. Mm -hmm. And that's the biggest concern I have when when we talk about the potential for a, you know, a world war, a third world war is I think it's unlikely to have a world war when both sides are talking to one another because you kind of realize, look, we're all humans. We all have you know, common causes, whether that's climate Mm -hmm. change or dealing with pandemics or whatever. But when Mm -hmm. you have two silos, two echo chambers that aren't talking to one another, that's almost like going back into the past where it's like 
we thought of like, you know, certain countries thought of different countries as being like less than human. Mm -hmm. You know, you could sort of see that. And there's a, also, you know, there's Thucydides trap, which we've talked about before, which is that any time throughout history where you have an existing overextended superpower against a rising new superpower that is on pace to overtake the current superpower. Mm -hmm. I think it's like 13 out of the 15 times that's happened in, in modern history, a, a war has resulted between those two nations. So it's very wow. much the rule, not the exception, for there to be war when one rising power is up against the existing power. And wow. we've never had the capabilities for destruction like we've had now. So it's, you know, I'm not saying that this is likely to happen in the near term, but it is something that with historical context, we should be worried about and, and consider. Yeah. Wow. I, I'm, I'm very interested to see what happens too. And I'm also really interested to see how each country, U.S. and the West and China and their influences expand because yeah. we've, I think we've talked about this before, but China is starting to really get a foothold into Africa and India, for example, building up their infrastructure. What does that yeah. mean? Is that like, are they potentially going to start censoring those um, networks? Are they going to just yeah. monitor well, they, and be spying? Like it, they already I don't, have. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so what I think what you're referring to is the Belt and Road Project, where, mm -hmm. you know, if this was the 19th century, we would call it empire building. And that's essentially what it is. They're building mm -hmm. a global empire. And, you know, we've already seen that the Great Chinese Firewall has extended beyond just China, especially if you're a Chinese citizen in another country. So just to take one example, Australia, which we typically think of as like, very Western, you know, mm -hmm. very much similar to the US or Canada or the UK, they have a serious problem of being dependent on China. You know, one of the biggest industries in Australia is mining of minerals. And China is their number one exporter, like that's their number one customer. Mm. And they're wow. so close to them. And there was this case I, I was reading about how, you know, so many Chinese citizens get educated in Australia. That's like one of the main places they go. Like like one in five international like students in Australia is from China. Mm -hmm. And they are monitored while they're in university there. So they have this whole network Whoa. of of uh, basically informants and administrators in all of these Australian universities through these like Confucius I think they're called like Confucius uh like I forget what it's called exactly. They're like Confucius groups or Confucius centers or something. Yeah. And, and they had this one case where there was a Chinese citizen who was studying in Australia and he was seen at a protest, uh, you know, for Hong Kong. And then the very next day, his family was detained because he had been informed by someone who was, you know, pro Beijing, who was at that university. And his family was basically like detained and, you know, I'm sure they use that as leverage against the student. Wow. And, you know, this is happening more and more where it's not just if you're in China, it's if you use Chinese uh, technology, like cell phones, it's if you're at any sort of organization or university that has ties to China. Um, yeah. and so that's on the side of like the Chinese firewall being beyond just China. And mm -hmm. then as far as like how they're using their leverage to actually take control of physical regions, they've been using the strategy called uh, debt diplomacy, where, okay. you know, just to take one other example, in Kenya, they offered to build this giant new port, you know, to increase the economic activity there. And so they did it. But then Kenya wasn't able to pay back the debt because they had difficult economic times. So then China now owns that port in Mombasa. And this is happening not only in Africa, also in South America, also in yeah. Southern and Eastern Europe and the poorer parts of Europe. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we already talked about Aust Australia, Southeast Asia. So, yep. so you're, you're starting to see an entire sphere of the world 
that's under Chinese influence and therefore that has to abide by Chinese laws and values around not saying or doing anything against what's in the Chinese Communist Party's interests. And then you're seeing the sphere of influence of the U.S. is still there, still very much real, but mm -hmm. seems to be declining. We are taking more of a nationalist approach and China seems to be filling in the void left yeah. by the U.S. Yeah, and that's the scary thing. What happens if we look forward a few decades and the U.S. could be on the decline? In a way, it seems like, it, you know, I personally think that it's on the decline, if, if nothing else, just intellectually mm -hmm. and, and in terms of like unification, because we have we don't really have unification anymore. And we're seeing a split even amongst the U.S. citizens pretty much straight down the middle. There's you're either one or the other and there's very little in between that you can really uh, have any influence over. And that's that's problematic, I think. So what do you think happens to places that are Western, like the UK, not necessarily um, tied to the US? Like, are, yeah. are they at risk for similar things? Um, yeah, so it's, it's interesting to see how different countries are dealing with it. So, for instance, Germany has this approach of we are going to analyze every piece of technology on the same set of parameters. So mm -hmm. we've tried to get the U.S. has tried to get Germany to just ban uh, Huawei totally for their 5G mm -hmm. infrastructure. But Germany has taken a more neutral approach and has said, look, we're going to have our cybersecurity experts analyze every piece of hardware and software, whether it's mm -hmm. from the U.S. or China. So we'll see how that plays out. I think that, you know, is a smart plan if you're able to truly identify the weak points and the potential entry points, which is mm -hmm. unclear if that's even possible, given how everything, you know, the Internet of Things means pretty much everything could be a weak point or point of entry yeah, yeah. Um, whereas other countries like you know the UK has been more along the US lines of realizing the dangers and concerns and you know in general the US like the, the so-called five eyes mm -hmm. are the closest knit group in the West which is the five English speaking Western democracies so the US Canada uh, the UK Australia and uh, I think it's in New Zealand is the last one. I, I, I okay, can't yeah. recall exactly. But mm. I think that those five eyes are going to stay tight and stay fairly Western. Okay. My, my concern is that a big part of China's strategy is in Europe, especially Southern Europe, like places that used to be part of the Soviet Union, like, you know, mm. Albania and Belarus and even Poland and... Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, so Eastern and Southern Europe are going to be in trouble. And just by the very nature of the EU, they share information through all their countries. So if you have parts of the EU that are in bed with China, essentially, then the whole EU is at risk. And, you know, I don't mm -hmm. think the EU is going to collapse in the short term, but I think it could collapse in the medium term, especially if you know, just like how the World Health Organization is a fairly China centric organization now, mm. that could be the same case with the EU. And what would that look like if all of a sudden the EU was sort of like in China's back pocket and, you know, maybe some countries wouldn't be like, mm -hmm. but I don't know. It's it's just really concerning when you look at the trends in all of these different areas across the world and the trend seems mm -hmm. clear, like China is gaining more and more in their sphere of influence, whereas the U.S. sphere of influence is waning. And mm -hmm. at the same time, you know, China has this plan called Destination 2049, which is by the year 2049, which is the hundredth anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. They mm -hmm. plan to dominate every major technological field. That includes AI, quantum computing, autonomous mm -hmm. weapons, you know, the space race technology. So yeah. I guess the I guess the next question I have for you is how concerned are you about 
each of these areas that, you know, it seems to me like if you dominate even one or two of these areas, you could potentially dominate everything. I mean, if you're the clear winner in AI yeah. or quantum computing or autonomous weapons or something like yeah. that, you could pretty much dominate on all fields. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, we've talked about that a lot. And the I think the foundational question is how much wealth can each one of these things generate? Or how much, you know, how much resources can each one of these things generate? Because let's say you have AI and you have it that generates more wealth for China. That basically means China can start influencing other countries by more investment. And like the more investment you have, then you start to influence all these different policies around the world. And ultimately, you can start to literally have a sort of global domination because you have by far the most money that is recognized across the globe. And that's, I think, honestly, we've talked about AI. That has the most potential for, I think, wealth generation. Yeah. And, um, but the, one of the things that we've also talked about is just resources in general, whether that's fuel, energy, minerals, and we've seen all of the investments China has made in Africa, which is one of the most resource rich places in the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it probably is in general, the most resource rich besides maybe South America and South America is also being heavily invested right. in. By China and, and Australia, probably the third biggest. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. all of these, all these crazy, like uh, biological resource havens are being um, looked at by China and have been invested in by China for the past decade or more. And I think all of these things kind of point to the fact that China is really gaining more wealth and gaining more status and gaining more power. Like that. I don't even know if it matters which one of the main technological um, resources it takes over. The fact that it would take over one or more probably means that it'll be a dominator, of, you know, of right. pretty much anything. Yeah, and there's this worrying trend of techno nationalism mm -hmm. in both the U.S. and China. And yep. so in China, there's they have this very real sense that not only do they want to you know, push forward and have progress, like in the sense that we do in America, but they want to get back to their roots of being the superpower that they used to be during the ancient, you know, Chinese dynasties. Mm -hmm. So yeah. they have this very nationalistic view of, you know, the pride in having their technology dominate the world. And mm -hmm. we're now starting to see that in the US too. You know, now with the COVID crisis, Apple and Google are essentially like government organizations. They're creating yeah. apps for track and trace. Amazon mm -hmm. is basically becoming the backbone of, of America's uh, you know infrastructure as far as our mm -hmm. transporting of goods and, and, and uh, products. Yeah. So it does seem like the trend is moving towards there's this American technology that is very much serving American interests, but also just individual mm -hmm. interests. Yep. Whereas China's technology is very much just focused on ch the Chinese Communist Party's interests, um, regardless yep. of where it's being used. Yep. And that's really worrisome to me because, you know, we've talked about it in the future of AI, but it's hard enough to develop a beneficial AI when that's actually what you're trying to do, when you're not trying to develop a beneficial AI and instead you're trying to develop an AI that can prevent, like, the truth from reaching your population and mm -hmm. specifically warping the truth for the good of a small, you know, party group, mm -hmm. then that's like, I mean, I, I don't know how much more dystopic you want to get, but that's pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I will say, I know, I know we've talked about this before, but one thing that I am hopeful about is the fact that China is so closed off to the outside world and general, uh, the general population, probably including scientists, are a little less informed than scientists around the globe because they don't have the context of everything else. 
um, to make discoveries and innovations with, I think that would keep China back and it'll hold them back in terms of how fast they can innovate. And I think places like the US that are free and information is open inherently have faster innovation innovation and that's like that's the that's a hope that i have that yeah. china isn't necessarily going to have as much um they're not going to be as fast at innovating but the problem is they can still steal this the patents they can steal the ideas and then we're probably going to see this situation where two like there are basically two versions of similar technology there's going to be an a U.S. or Western or free version of artificial intelligence that's beneficial, hopefully, if mm -hmm. we can figure out that problem. And then we're going to have an AI developed Yeah, like China. an authoritarian government in a box. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so given all of this and in our discussion about the decoupling, how do we actually go about decoupling from China? Yeah, I would say that what we definitely don't want to do is make too aggressive posturing right away because the fact mm. remains that China is the largest manufacturer in the world. We still depend on them for a ton of our goods and services that are really critical to the U.S. So mm. we shouldn't be super aggressive about it or confrontational. I think the best approach would be if we sort of just take a, un, you know, unemotional it's not you it's me like if you're breaking up with a, a crazy <laughs> girlfriend or something and you basically just say look a transparent system is just simply not compatible with a non-transparent system so mm -hmm. if china becomes more transparent then you know we can have more intimate integrations with one another but mm -hmm. the fact is is that if you have one system that's fully transparent and another system that's not, the non-transparent system can basically just take and pick and choose whatever it wants from the transparent system, whereas the transparent system doesn't really gain anything from the non-transparent system. And the interesting thing, to your point, I actually remember what I was going to say, is that even though it seems like a major advantage that the U.S. has free-flowing information, whereas China does not, I was mm -hmm. reading into this and China has their own internal document system where any, you know, scientific papers, research papers, patents, anything like that that could be useful for Chinese citizens and companies, they mm. have that available. So they can freely share the information from the U.S. and the rest of the world that they find oh. valuable. Not only that, but people in China use VPNs, virtual private networks, mm -hmm pretty common uh, in order to just search the web and do research on what Western country, countries mm -hmm. and companies are thinking and doing. And the interesting thing is that if you're a traveler in China, you can use a VPN and you probably won't really get in trouble. It's like kind of, at least at this point, it's like kind of accepted that that's what foreigners do because how else are mm -hmm. you going to use Skype or you yeah. know maps or whatever else you need? Mm -hmm. But if you are if you live in China and you're a Chinese citizen, then you have to get special permission from the government to use a VPN. And if you're caught using it for purposes that are not allowed, you will get thrown in jail. So let's say you work for a company, legitimate company in China, like you work for Alibaba and, you know, you have a. Uh, verified like you're allowed to have a VPN because you need to research what Amazon is doing and whatever mm -hmm. you know, what the prices are there but then you start looking into you know the history of Hong Kong and Tiananmen Square and you know human rights abuses mm -hmm. they're probably gonna figure that out and you're gonna get a knock on your door from the secret police oh that's scary <laughs> yeah so, I, so I, the whole point in saying that is that it's not that much of an advantage for us to have free-flowing information so long as they can access whatever they deem useful. And honestly, now that you say that, it might even be 
a slight disadvantage to have too much information like we do in the US because one of the major problems that researchers have is there is such a vast quantity of literature about there and a lot of the literature is very incremental or not even that useful if you're looking at research papers um, because we are incentivized in the US our academic system um, incentivizes researchers to publish papers so we basically have a quantity over quality sort of situation right. whereas in China where they can like pick and choose what's even available there's less information and or you know a um, smaller quantity of papers to choose from but those papers might be higher impact and more useful to the research at hand so right. who knows maybe maybe I'm totally wrong that China will be slower in innovating right plus plus we're open to disinformation campaigns from Russia or China mm -hmm. or wherever else whereas mm -hmm. it's not like we can really inject US propaganda into China yeah. given their firewall yeah, China is its own disinformation campaign, yeah. but it's at least a unified but, disinformation campaign. Yeah. Although one thing I will say to your point on a little bit of an optimistic side is that I think it is making us more resilient as consumers of information because we have mm -hmm. to have that critical eye towards is this yeah. real? Is it fake? Is it trustworthy? Mm -hmm. So and I've noticed this with younger people that, you know, Gen Z's and just the younger the younger you get, the less prone to disinformation manipulation you are. Like that's mm -hmm. why all the crazy conspiracy theorists of Pizzagate or whatever else, it's all like people in their 60s who like didn't grow up with the <laughs> internet. They don't really get it. It's the same people that fall victim to like a Nigerian prince offering you money <laughs> through an email. So yeah. I, I am a little bit optimistic that we'll get better and better at spotting disinformation because we have a free internet here. Mm. Yeah, and it's interesting to think about what that looks like in the coming decades because earlier we were talking about how China, the generations that knew freedom and knew critical thinking and knew, you know, knew that they should maybe be questioning authority are dying out. So there you're seeing a unification of thought there and then here we're seeing a more diverse range of thought in the West when there's free and open information. So totally. That, that's a really good point. All right. Well, I just want to make one small point and then let's get into the future scenarios. And that okay. point is there is another advantage the U.S. has over China. And that is that the U.S. dollar is a global reserve currency. Mm. Now, Ray Dalio just wrote about this in his latest LinkedIn post where he talks about the economic fallout of the COVID-19 crisis. And he makes it clear that countries that are part of the U.S. or, or part of global reserve currencies are mm -hmm. able to print almost endless money because that's what other countries use to have like real wealth for international transactions. So just to mm -hmm. put some numbers on it, 61% of all international transactions use the US dollar. 25% of all international transactions use the euro. And then less than that is the Japanese yen, the British pound, and then the Chinese yen is even below that. So mm. right now, it may be a short term advantage and this may change over time. But there is a very real immediate advantage right now for the U.S. to be able to print tons of money and bail out companies, help individuals. If we wanted, we could even implement UBI and Medicare for all and probably yeah. not go broke or go into crazy amounts of debt. Whereas mm -hmm. if you're like, you know, uh, if you're Argentina or Brazil or you're some country that doesn't have a global reserve currency, you are simply not able to print money and just not really, you know, care so much about what the effects are down the line. Like hmm. you have to have dollars or euros on hand and your currency has to be worth enough to convert to dollars or euro for your economy to be valid. So hmm. if I were like, I mean, we'll get into the, this more with the future scenarios, but if I were the U.S. government, I would 
do everything possible to use that right now to our advantage to invest in things that will actually put us in a better position long term, like education of our citizens, you know, better schools, better, uh, you know, infrastructure, moving from just in time to just in case economics. Like we have a real uh, advantage now, but if we don't use it, then it's going to wane and the same mm -hmm. trends are going to continue. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I'm I'm curious to know what your thoughts are on how the Chinese yen will change in its dominance as China itself Im increases its dominance. Yeah. Um, maybe that's a, a good worst case scenario discussion. <laughs> So what do you think for the worst case scenario? Worst case scenario. My worst case scenario is pretty awful. A lot of our topics coalesce into a not so great future. Mm -hmm. Here's how I see it playing out in the worst case. The so-called devolution of the U.S. continues and I've already seen some worrying signs of that with the, you know, reopening the U.S. economy. There's been the Western Pact and the Eastern Pact of these states doing this. And Gavin Newsom talks about California as a nation state. And, you know, while I love California and the idea of being a standalone nation sounds kind of sweet, I think it would be awful if the United States was no longer the United States. It kind of reminds yeah. me of the movie Children of Men where they talk about the former United States of America and it's just pandemonium of people like throwing rocks and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All those crazy cowboys let loose. Oh my gosh. But seriously, I am worried that as our institutions become less and less capable and you know, crony capitalism becomes a bigger problem in the U.S. and the trends of our inability to, you know, build the appropriate infrastructure and get the right tests. And as that just pales in comparison to China's capabilities of, you know, building a bridge in like five hours and, and just how efficient everything is because of their top down rule that mm -hmm. over time, the U S will continue to devolve and, just the trends of our sphere of influence continuing to wane as there's more and more nationalism in the U.S. and we just care more and more about taking care of the U.S., that mm -hmm. that creates a void that China steps in to fill to a greater and greater extent as time goes on, especially mm -hmm. in, in order, Southeast Asia, Africa, uh, South America, and Southern and Eastern Europe and that mm -hmm. through this, eventually, the alliance of the European uh, Union and their values around freedom and, and you know, free thought, that that starts to become more China-centric and that it either the U EU breaks up or it just is sort of in China's back pocket because enough powerful people have been, you know, given money or threatened or whatever else so that it's no longer this like third major power as opposed mm -hmm. to the U S or, or China. Yeah. And that, you know, all of that would happen up until there is a major turning point where I think China could seriously have a major, you know, game changing innovation either in artificial intelligence in quantum computing and autonomous weapons in uh, mm -hmm. you know space travel or just dominating satellites in space in bioweapons uh, maybe mm -hmm. in some other technological uh, capacity so they're able to extend their firewall you know mm -hmm. e even to an even further extent i think all of that is likely to happen unless trends shift like we're kind of on that that's like kind of the default path um, you know mm -hmm. a counter argument would be that the global image of China has seriously been damaged from the current crisis. And so maybe the Western countries will all wake up and, you know, sort of move against China. But 
I don't really see that as the dominant trend. I see the dominant trend as China continuing to gain influence and gain control. And the other countries are just kind of worried, but not really doing anything. Kind of just like mm-hmm. standing stiff. Yeah. And, and then I guess the other thing I'm really worried about is, let's say from a financial perspective, the U.S. opens its economy back up. We have a second wave that is bigger mm-hmm. than the first wave of infections. Yep. People aren't able to pay back their debts. So there's a massive debt crisis. And then the stock market plummets because people no longer have confidence in the system. And it creates the biggest single loss of wealth in modern history. And that could be like a major spark where, okay, China is more powerful than the US. Like it's definitive. We don't have to wait till Mm -hmm. 2030. This already happened. Yeah. And in that case, like talking about like the future now, like if that happened, what would it actually be like to live in China or the US? Yeah. So, you know, I think that in the US, it would likely be sort of like a, you know, like more like an every man for himself, like there'd be a lot of inequality. So some, you know, wealthy people would still have their own like castles of protection and, you know, private security and sort of like how in ancient Rome, all of the wealthy people just had like their own like private sort of militia so they could keep themselves safe rather Mm -hmm. than depending as much on like a national police force or national army. Mm -hmm. So I think it could be really bad for a lot of people in America, but I think America would still have its own sort of like autonomy and still sort of be able to live in the way that it wants, but it just would no longer be a superpower and it wouldn't be as, Mm -hmm. it wouldn't, be as great for most Americans to yeah. to live in that world and our ability to travel to other places and speak freely and it just would be curtailed. Mm-hmm. And as far as living in China, I think, you know, first on the positive side, a lot of people will be lifted out of poverty. If you're someone who is okay to just, you know, tow the party line and not speak out of turn and just live your life with kind of your head down and and not really make too many waves, then you might have a great life. You might, Mm -hmm. you have enough food on the table. You'll get to go to, you know, nice Disneyland type places. You'll be able to have like good technology and apps and whatever. Uh And, you know, you better not say anything against the party because you're not, you, you know, it could get even to the point where literally thought crimes occur. Like that's not, out of the realm of possibility when we talk about future technology. It's already, yeah. to an extent, there is some thought crime with just seeing what people are searching in Google, right? That's like kind of your own mm-hmm. private area for thoughts. Yeah. Um, it could get deeper than that even. And, and then I would say living elsewhere, so if you're living in Europe or Australia or South America or Africa, over time, you're just going to have to live more and more within the rules of China. And there's not going to be free flowing information. And, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's just going to be more limited what you're allowed to think. Yeah, we move into sort of a hive mind rather than a lot of individuals. Yeah, that, (laughs) that really sums up uh, uh, pretty much everything that could go wrong in this situation. Um, The one thing that I find interesting here is our worst case scenario is the best case scenario for some, for the people, for the people in power at the People's Republic of China. And what I wonder is what's, what is actually the end result? Like, what are they even working towards? We don't really, I mean, yes, power, but what do, what do they hope to gain with said power when it's achieved? Is it to make sure every one of their citizens is happy? Like, is it, like, it's probably not, or, well, I, or maybe I sort of, it is. That's a really good question. I sort of view it as like, sort of like going from a value system where you value the individual ants to a system where you only value the ant farm as a mm-hmm. whole or the ant colony as a whole. And Mm -hmm. you could kind of think of this as like two human strategies, like two grand human strategies. Either we really care about how individuals are doing and their ability to contribute and have different opinions. Or you're like, Mm -hmm. who cares about individuals? Like, I'll kill as many people as I need to so long as the collective ant colony Mm -hmm. is is doing well. 
And so yeah. from that perspective, like, yeah, maybe it's good for humanity on like a grand special level. Mm -hmm. But as far as the quality of life for any individual member of that species, it seems mm -hmm. to me to be definitely worse. Yeah. And if, if the ultimate metric, and this is something Sam Harris talks about, about a lot is like, what is the ultimate metric for living for like mm -hmm. living a good life or morality that seems to be from a lot of people's perspective, just increasing the well-being, which is, you know, that's sort of subjective, but the well-being of individuals should be maximized. And I really, like, <laughs> I strongly disagree with the direction China is going. And I think a lot of people who have the information, you know, think that way. But, you know, plus, but back to, oh, go ahead. Plus, oh, sorry, just one thing I was going to say is, plus, if you think about what this is spawning as far as, like, a grand future... Mm -hmm. If we believe that at some point machines will be more intelligent than humans, and I mm -hmm. think that's a totally valid assumption, mm -hmm. then we could be giving birth to our technological overlords that police what we think and do and say. Mm -hmm. Is that what we want? Do we want overlords that are going to police us and make sure we're not stepping out of line? Or do we want AI that basically empowers us to do the most of what we can do so long as we're not harming others. Mm -hmm. Like that seems to me like we like even unintentionally, perhaps China could be giving birth to like a really awful AI supremacy yeah. scenario. Yeah. And that, that might be where they're going with this technology. They might see that and be planning for that, which is terrifying. And that's, that could be another worst case scenario. Like there are so many different worst case scenarios that are valid for this particular conversation. Um, but I agree with you on pretty much every single one of your points. I think that in the worst case scenario, the U S devolves and you know, that's, it doesn't seem too far from the likely scenario um, for a pessimistic uh, outlook, but it also, in the worst case scenario, China is the dominant provider of anything. Like I saw that China is the dominant or is investing heavily in all of these countries in agriculture. So what happens if China is the main owner of the global supply chain for food? Mm -hmm. That's not good because then they essentially have power over literally the a basic resource that humans need. And if they have power over that, that means they have real power over people that aren't directly um, mm -hmm. even in their uh, current sphere of influence or in their firewall. Like they can just affect the world by how they change the prices of food. And, you know, we kind of see that oil is a similar situation right now. Like when oil plummets, the whole world is affected. Mm -hmm. Um, and I would, you know, one of the things that I am starting to believe more strongly is just diversity. And we talk, we've talked about biodiversity before, how biodiverse ecosystems are the most resilient. Mm -hmm. And I'm starting to get that way with just the economy in general. If we're too dependent on one particular country or one particular company, then it's probably no good. Like it's probably not a good system and it's probably not a resilient system or not mm -hmm. an anti-fragile system. Yeah. Whereas if we did have a system that was maybe a little bit more decentralized, we have small producers all over the place, whether that's food or technology or whatever, then we're going to be in a situation, well, that kind of gets into the best case. But in the worst case, China dominates all of these and mm -hmm. we have an extremely fragile system. So if anything happens, we're not in a position, the world is not in a position to do anything about it because there could very well be more COVID like situations. We're going to see the effects of climate change come through in, let's say in a hundred years, what are extreme weather events going to look like? Mm -hmm. Probably something we can't fathom right now. And... Oh, yeah. Imagine if the big <laughs> earthquake finally happened in California, which has been leading the economic recovery in the U.S. 
Mm-hmm. Like that could be a cascading effect. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I'm extremely worried about is we aren't going to be in a position if China is the foundational leader of the economy or if any one country is the sole or clear leader of the economy, what happens when an event like COVID or an event like some extreme natural disaster occurs? Because there is a an extreme amount of evidence that's coming out that weather events are just going to get more and more extreme as climate change makes Mm -hmm. more and more of an impact. Like I saw this interesting meme where we had, um, like there was all this talk about flattening the curve. So we had this like little bump on the curve and everyone's like super excited that we flattened the curve for the COVID pandemic. And then they're all looking at this small little bump. And then behind them is this massive mountain of a curve that is climate change. Right. And right. Like, we well, there is have... that, there is this phenomenon where we're always fighting the last war because uh-huh. that's what what's in our most recent mind. So yeah. you'll see a lot of investment in, you know, pandemic preparedness after this, mm-hmm. but we don't know if that's going to be the next crisis. The next crisis could be climate change or, or bio, you know, or uh, some sort of we- autonomous weapon or, mm-hmm. you know. And that so might be what options. it is. Yeah. Like if, and for example, here's another worse, I was, you know, thinking about how China could um, potentially use this to their, this COVID thing to their advantage. And there's a lot of talk about like potential conspiracy theories of like China sort of letting this out into the general populace, which... I wouldn't put it past them, but I don't know if like the evidence is necessarily pointing towards that. But if it was, you know, we're talking about worst case scenario, not most likely right. scenario. Let's say this is all part of a plan. And in that plan, COVID is just a weakening agent, essentially. Mm-hmm. There could be a step two to this plan. There could be a step two where there's a much more extreme, like basically this just weakened all the other countries. And then once we're kind of at a low point of the COVID situation, then another crisis hits or another, maybe it's another virus that, you know, COVID was basically, it weakened the immunity, weakened the bodies in some way that we can't really detect right now. And then this next virus is the thing that like really does damage. Who knows? I don't think that that's the likely scenario, but if, if we're talking about, a government that plans very far out and is thinking extremely strategically about all its decisions. I wouldn't put it past them if this was, you know, yeah. one of those, um, if it actually was a conspiracy or it was something that, that they sort of planned. Um, well, apparently there was an inspection of the, you know, bio research facility in Wuhan several years mm-hmm. ago and they found that they were not following the appropriate guidelines for containing their samples. Mm -hmm. So there does seem to be some circumstantial evidence that points to not necessarily that they released it intentionally, but that it could have unintentionally been released from their, you know, their Mm -hmm. highest end, you know, bio research lab in Wuhan. That's totally plausible. Like I don't, I haven't seen any, evidence that that couldn't be the case. So Mm -hmm. I think it's important that we keep all questions open and that it's not, we're not afraid to ask anything. Um, Mm -hmm. But, you know, like like you said, we're not saying it's the most likely scenario. It's just a possibility and we should consider all possibilities. Yeah. And we're talking about the worst case scenario here. And, (laughs) you know, that, that can open up some questions that are, you know, they definitely lead to extremely terrible um, circumstances. But anyways, maybe to lighten it up a little bit, we talk about the best case scenarios here. Best case scenario. I'll start with the best case of what happens in the U.S. and then I'll say what the best case is that happens in China. So the best Mm -hmm. case in the U.S. is that we use this crisis as a way to restructure our economy so that we can set the stage for real productivity growth and real innovation in the United States. So productivity growth has been pretty much stagnant in the last 10 years, because Mm -hmm. even though we have computers to help us, 
we've had a lot of bullshit jobs. The economy has been mm -hmm. essentially playing with like monopoly money and we haven't really had to focus on profitability in like a real cash flow sense. So I'm hopeful that this crisis will set the stage for real productivity growth. Companies will get more effective at doing what they do. And we will, like I said earlier, we'll move from just in time to just in case where we're not mm -hmm. totally dependent on China. We have suppliers in Mexico. We have suppliers in India. We have suppliers in Vietnam. I've, I've read that those are probably the three biggest beneficiaries of the U.S. decoupling from China economically. And I think we could unleash a whole wave of new innovation, new companies, because now we should be more focused on building products that are good for people, not just good for wallets, like real impact yeah. investing. And I think that's been a major yeah. shift where it's not just about how much money can you make? Oh, it's cheaper in China. Oh, let's let's manufacture there. And then like that, that is an old way of thinking. Now, like we mm -hmm. are moving more towards techno nationalism. So I think because we're moving towards that, it could help make, you know, even the big tech companies more resilient in the face of China, because maybe we will help subsidize companies for taking manufacturing outside of China, for instance. Mm -hmm. And we will do what needs to be done so that it's not too expensive for individuals. So in the same way that yep. that China subsidizes the healthcare costs of its citizens, we should do the same thing in the U.S. And I'm hopeful that mm -hmm. this will also bring about a movement of Medicare for all, of universal basic income for all, and really investing mm -hmm. in education, especially science and technology and yeah. cyber warfare, autonomous weapons, quantum computing, artificial intelligence. If mm -hmm. we seriously invest in these areas and we're focused on the real impact, not just making profit, then I could see the, yeah. this be like, the beginning of a giant like US bull market where things get better and better for the average person. And five years from now, America could be an amazing place to live. It could be a place where yeah. everyone in society has what they need and everyone also has the, the uh, potential to become like essentially like a, a god, not in like a bad way, but like just you could be able to accomplish so much and really maximizing individuals' mm -hmm. um, potential. So that's what I think yeah. would be the best case in the U.S. The best case in mm -hmm. China would, in my view, would be a peaceful revolution. The people demanding that they be allowed to play Animal Crossing, <laughs> along with like <laughs> a million other things that they should be allowed to do. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how likely that is, but I did hear one China expert say, don't discount the possibility of a revolution in China. It may not be likely, but it is possible. And a couple arguments that that may be more possible than we think. One is China has recently increased their death counts by 10x in Wuhan and by like 40 percent in other in I think across the country as a whole. So the very mm -hmm. fact that they have had to increase their death count numbers shows that the party story is has some weak points, right? Their citizens yeah. must be kind of catching on to, okay, it's not the full story, because why else would they increase their death count metrics? Yeah. Same thing with how, yeah. if you remember at the beginning of the COVID crisis, there was that doctor, Dr. Lee, who was basically whistleblowing and saying, look, this is way worse than they're telling us. You need to be safe. Like I'm, you know, I'm going to die here. And then he ended up dying and the people in China viewed him as a hero for getting the real word out in a system that basically clamped down on anyone trying to get the real word out. So mm -hmm. what happened after that is that China, then Beijing, the Chinese communist party, made him into a hero also. And they said, Dr. Li is so great. And they basically rewrote history to make it seem like he wasn't specifically going against their authority. And, oh. but, but that shows that, yeah. you know, they have to, they can't just totally 
clamp down on Dr. Lee and eliminate him from history, they had to kind of move a little bit in that direction so that the people didn't get too upset. So, you know, even though these are pretty small, like rebellions, if you could even call them that, it shows that there are some cracks in the Chinese, you know, firewall system of information mm-hmm. control. So my best yeah. case scenario for China would be that the people do revolt and there's a peaceful transition to a democracy. Again, this is best case, not most likely, but that yeah. would be my scenario. And then I would say for the rest of the world, it's that they come over more to America's leadership if America does retake the position of being a world leader and that yeah. they think twice before they allow so much Chinese investment with debt diplomacy, so much tech infrastructure being developed from Huawei or China, and mm-hmm. you know that, that they see the real dangers in that before it's too late. Yeah. Yeah, I think those are all um, really good points. In the best case for me, it's, it's really that this, like all of these, this uh, crisis and the aftermath of this crisis leads to regrowth and rethinking everything that we think is currently important in the way that our system is set up. Because right now our system is not set up in a way that handled this well at all. And part of that is because there's so much misinformation and um, it's just really hard to see what the truth of things are. And we're also seeing how broken and corrupt things are um, with the U.S. in particular. Mm -hmm. And I think that'll lead to just general awareness in the population. And I think that we're going to get to the point where we're, in, in the best case, we get to the point where we are actually um, able to understand that not everything is um, true that is told to us by our government. And I think that like this could have been the thing that does not get Trump reelected. Like because of COVID, Trump might not get reelected. Like I don't think he the views of Trump are going to be more positive after this. At least I don't I don't see how they could be. I've I haven't seen that much fox news yet so <laughs> well I wanna, maybe... let's talk about how good trump's response has been because i think there are good things he's done that he actually should be given a lot of credit for but there's also bad things he's done as it relates to the china relationship like okay. pa- particularly i would say that i give trump major credit for being the only president to actually stand up to china And yeah, maybe it was a political strategy to help him get elected because he's tapping into xenophobia Mm -hmm. among his base. That's true. But it's also true that China has serious human rights violations. They are not a free society. They are not a society that we should just be helping to grow unfettered. Mm. And, you know, people got gave Trump a lot of flack for starting a trade war. From my perspective, that was the right thing to do because someone had to call China out on, you know, taking all of our patents and aside from Uh that, just basically not being a fair trading partner. And it's like also Mm -hmm. it's like strategically, why would we just give this, you know, this rising superpower, which is very clearly contesting our, our position And, you know, it's not like they have the same values we do. So that has very real world ramifications of what happens if they surpass Mm -hmm. us. That we can't just let that grow unfettered. We have to push back. And if we're not going to push back now, then Mm -hmm. pushing back 10 years from now when they've already made the great leap and they're already in a, you know, surpassed us, that's not going to help. So I give Trump major props for what he's done, uh, you know, with actually standing up to China but I think the major flaw in his approach is that it's only been bilateral. It's just been the U.S. and China. He hasn't brought in the rest of the international community. Uh, and you Yeah, know, well, he hasn't earned the respect of the international right. community, which is the problem. Yeah, like, so that's like, because we, we have way more uh, influence when we go in there with, with Germany and France and Japan and you know, all these other countries than if we just go at it alone. So I wish we had like a combination of like Obama's ability to build coalitions 
and Trump's just like boldness in being willing to stand up and not really care about the political ramifications. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, I guess that's my take on Trump's China response. Yeah. And I guess, um, you know, I I don't know what the situation I was talking particularly about the COVID situation, like it might have weakened where he was previously to where he will be after COVID just because like the COVID response, I don't think was strong on basically any front. Um, right. But yeah. the, the trade war, I agree. Like that's a, that was a major thing when we were actually like kind of calling them out on their bullshit for some of our, you know, some of these trade policies. So that's good. Um, but I think in the best case, the U S again, become stronger. We totally reform our work system. Maybe work from home and remote work is more of an option in general for people. And maybe we realize that, okay, I guess students can learn remotely, or we learn how important it is for people of lower income to have internet. Because that that's one of the things that I've realized recently is a serious problem. The fact that lower income individuals don't have access to the internet, that's a almost unfathomable disadvantage. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to really put a number on how much of a disadvantage it is to not have internet, but it's really keeping people that are currently in poverty and it, it's keeping them in poverty. And I, I just, I worry that that um, would remain the case, but if we respond well, we can maybe give internet to everyone and maybe, you know, Elon Musk's Starlink helps give internet to everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, assuming there's no firewall, but I doubt anything that Elon Musk <laughs> produces would have a firewall like China's. But yeah, yeah. That's, that's kind of the best case for the U.S. is we come out stronger and we rebuild our systems. Like you said, we actually implement a sort of Medicare for all and a universal basic income. And ultimately, the U.S. will be in a situation where there's more entrepreneurship and better education. People can go back and educate themselves and totally change what they're doing in their careers if they're not happy. So, like, it could lead to ultimate happiness in the United States, which would be awesome. And I kind of agree with you on China. A peaceful revolution would probably be the best and just a dismantling of the People's Republic of China. I think that's the most important thing. I think that it, it isn't very likely that there's a peaceful protest. I think a a violent protest is fairly likely because there will only be a, um, or a, a peace, sorry, a violent revolution is more likely because of how yeah. the People's Republic of China would. How they tend to um, respond. And has history. Right. Yeah. I mean, they, there's a lot of videos surfacing, um, about, you know, protests in China. And that's actually really promising, but it's very violent. Like I've seen a couple of videos. I'm like, Oh, I I don't know if I wanted to watch that because of how they respond. It's extremely graphic and violent. And I want to say just one more thing about the best case and then making it into the most likely. And that is that Mm -hmm. I believe the single most important thing for the U S right now is to stick to our values, Mm -hmm. to stick to the values Mm -hmm. of, free speech, free thought, free assembly, democracy, because those values, like even if the U.S. gets nuked and wiped off the face of the earth, those values can still survive over Mm -hmm. across generations. But if the U.S. continues to get more corrupt, if it becomes more true to say that the U.S. is corrupt and they don't really care about democratic values, they just care about what's best for them, that's the biggest threat Mm -hmm. to the world order. So I would do yeah. everything in our power to really stand up for those values and make it clear that we actually care about them, that we walk the walk, mm-hmm. and that you can't do business with us unless you abide by those same values. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. So what do you think about the uh, likely scenario then? Most likely scenario. My most likely scenario is that the world splits on semi-amicable terms, meaning 
we will have a U.S. sphere of influence. We will have a China sphere of influence and the decoupling will continue. And mm -hmm. it will, you know, it's hard to say what like, because it sort of feels like it's going to end up being the best case or the worst case eventually. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's not like we can yeah. just have two separate world economies forever. It seems like just by the nature of how natural systems evolve over time, that one mm -hmm. is going to dominate versus the other eventually. So, you know, maybe I'm a, maybe I'm biased because I'm a, you know, freedom loving American. But, but I think that in the end the good guys will win and when good guy, when i say good guys i don't mean like americans or chinese i mean the values of freedom and being able to think what you want and say what you want and have free discourse and not worry about you know about going against the people in power i think that mm -hmm. will win out in the end and yeah and it just seems like a, a more anti-fragile position to be on the side of what you would intuitively think to be true, you know, that, cause I feel like mm -hmm. when you come into this world, you have instincts about what is and isn't right. Like even if you're a two year old, a two year old knows what's fair. Like if you take a toy away mm -hmm. from a two year old and give it to someone else and don't let, and don't allow for any sharing, the two year old will know that's not right. I think it's mm -hmm. the same thing with all people. And people will instinctively, even if you, like, let's say 100 years from now or 75 years from now, you grow up in a Chinese society and they have total control of information. Like, no one is left to even tell you about what the world was like before. I still think, mm -hmm. even in that scenario, that you're going to notice something's not right. You're going to feel it in your bones that something's not right. And so I think mm -hmm. that as long as that we haven't gotten to the point where there's just total AI dominance and there's basically no hope and for any like, you know, meet, meet humans, <laughs> monkeys to like make a difference. As long as we haven't reached that point of no return, I think that the values of being able to say and do and think what you want will win out over the values of top down authoritarian, to uh, you know, basically thought control. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And it's also worth pointing out, you said that it doesn't matter if, whether it's the US or China, it could turn out th that in, let's say, 200 years, or 500 years, the US is authoritarian, and China is completely free. Yeah, like things, exactly. Think the whole world is dynamic like that. So it's easier to think about this in terms of the values that went out than the countries right. or like the geographic locations that went out. Cause ultimately in the long term it doesn't mean anything because they are so dynamic. Um, so I, I agree with that. I like that take. Um, I would say that, that I'm also hopeful. I'm hopeful that we are going to come out stronger at the end of all of these crises. And there's, there's going to be something like there are going to be, I think it's going to get worse. Like, like always, I think it's going to get worse and it's going to cause some sort of shift in the mindset. And there might even be a war, right? Like there could be so much polarity in the U S that it leads to a sort of civil war. Maybe not like the civil war that happened in the 1800s where it's, citizens actually shooting each other but it could be more of a economic political war or mm -hmm. an ep economic civil war or a cyber um civil war it doesn't have to be you know guns and military mm -hmm. but i do think there's going to be something that really separates first but we're going to come out stronger and i even in that war i think there tends to be the more um the more informed you are the more progressive you are. That's why I think we see a lot of PhDs and technologically advanced companies tend to be a little bit more liberal and open, mm -hmm. not necessarily like far left um, liberal, but you know, a little bit more open, open to free society, a little bit um, more critical in, in the way that they think and approach problems. And I think that that could lead to 
you know, the <laughs> that side winning out in the U.S. conflict. Mm-hmm. Um, and when that happens, I think that we could be in a situation where it really approaches the best case scenario, where there is freedom, there is better uh, systems in place, and we are resilient. So, right. yeah, all of this to say that I think that it, we will end up in a better situation, um, but there will be some major turmoil in the meantime. Yeah. Um, and I think China, probably the same thing. I really don't, I don't foresee a system like that winning out in the long term because of how fragile it actually is. Like the fact that they are so dependent on an, some central authority, I, it doesn't make sense from any system. Any resilient system requires diversity of thought. It requires just people to be more open and more, uh, there needs to be more flux in the system. So I think inherently it is an unstable system. Like the people's mm-hmm. Republic of China is an unstable system and eventually it will collapse. Unless and they have like superior AI that can manage all things all, all at once. That's that really true. the race. It feels like we're racing against that clock to me. That is, I could see that being the case, but the interesting thing is, discoveries like that tend to happen in parallel like i don't think that there will be a discovery of ai in china without there also being a similar discovery in the united states or elsewhere um so you know there might be there might be a competing you know ai system at some point but yeah (laughs) yeah we'll see who who has better data who has more information i think probably the society that is well actually now that i think about it china will probably have more data because they have the world's data and their own data whereas the world will have the world's data minus china's data right uh, because right, china right. doesn't allow that then yeah uh, but whatever so happens i mean it's a pretty damn interesting time to be alive i mean the amount of yeah. change that's going on right now is absolutely yeah. incredible so you know, mm-hmm. it's scary for sure, but it's also an exciting time to be alive. And also every person listening to this can help shape the future in some small way, even if it's having conversations mm-hmm. with your friends and families about the importance of, of freedom of thought, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. And so I, I very much hope that we enter that best case scenario, but we should definitely keep a keen eye on the worst and most likely scenarios as well. We are all so, here today. I think that's a good place to end it. Justin, thank you for joining us for this. It's been a great discussion. Yeah. This has been the future of U.S. China relations. And we'll see you next time. The past, the present, and the future. Present.